What it is, what's up? Another video on the cut. This video is special. It's my first I guess my first Game of Thrones content, maybe ever on the channel, but definitely my first one since House of Dragon has been the uh premiere product. I picked a good fucking time to do it. That was the best episode to this point. Ignore these motherfuckers screaming out there in the background. I don't know what the fuck they're doing, but uh that was the best episode by far. That was the most Game of Thrones episode by far, too. Um, I feel like they've done a pretty good job of uh, really making the, pol the political aspect of all of this be uh, commonplace again, which just left the fucking building the last episodes and uh, or last two seasons in the previous series. Um, and even though the pol politics was a big part of five and six, I feel like it was uh, done worse with having no uh, book material to base off on. This is uh, pretty close to peak Game of Thrones level politicking that goes on here. Uh, I'm going to get into spoilers from this point on, so I hope you guys can take that and do with it what you will. But uh, I'm going to go probably go stream of conscious for the most part because it's, it, it's so hard to break this down. Even, I mean, it's... So just... Try to go as best as possible with following the flow of what I'm doing here. So from the jump, this was a weird episode. Um, Damon, Tar I watched the the uh, preview last week. I'm I'm not doing it this week because not really. I, I don't think the preview did really like looking back. I don't think the preview really spoiled anything, even about the tone of this episode. I thought based on the preview, I thought this episode was going to be like basically. Damon, well, I guess this did happen. I thought Damon's going to run some angle to basically upend Viserys from the throne. But it's going to be like some, like, I don't know, some political advisor gets killed or something like that. I, I didn't have any thought processes that involve sex, <laughs> essentially, which is Damon's um, premier weapon of choice, it seems like, at times. Uh, so Damon comes back after doming the uh crab feeder and assorted parties uh takes a dragon in oh yeah i forgot um so officially she has she being renair has her first i guess auctioning off to various lords uh at some fucking oh somewhere some random ass castle and i guess kind of the biggest and brightest uh of the lords come through it's really like funny. I mean, almost all spiteful Renera dialogue is funny, but some real quips there. We get uh, an eight-year-old fucking disheveling some grown-ass lord. Uh, you can really, <laughs> it, it's cool because like you kind of see like it, it kind of reflects back on these people that are of certain backgrounds, you just have experience that other ones do not. The eight-year-old was, like, one of the first men, which is, if you remember correctly, like the fucking people that basically became the Night King and associated, you know, individuals. Um, he's a, a uh, descendant of those people. He obviously has some experience being a fucking man out there. And then some lore that's kind of, you know, princely and all that shit. Uh, was basically shit-talking him with him being eight years old. Uh, called him a, quite a few funny things. Uh, actually kind of impressed the princess. He was doing it to to make a show of the thing and gain some easy brownie points, which it worked until the fucking eight-year-old just, just remembered the motherfucker, got him out the paint very quickly. Uh, so that'll probably cause some war somewhere. But uh, we go from there after her coming back to the uh, King's Landing prematurely because she just was not interested in the marriage aspect once again. Uh, her and Chris and Kobe took the same discussion. Uh, in episode three and episode four, pretty much the same uh, nature of Renair Targaryen, not interested in being wet off, not interested in being treated by cattle. And at the same time, where she's coming back, uh, the other dragon that is not part of King's Landing, that is this Damon Targaryen's dragon, uh, comes back, uh, knocks him off the pivot a little bit, and pretty much comes in around the same time that Renair does. And we see Damon come in, make this whole show about, uh, you know, I killed, you know, the fucking, the crab feeder and all those scum. 
you know, I did this, you know, I, I did it for you, though, because I'm a member of the realm still, you know, I have a crown on, I'm the king of the living seas or whatever the hell it's called, but uh, I'm still, you know, servant of the crown, you know, blah, 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 humbling himself, uh, seemingly, and, you know, they kind of walk off, and they have, like, a little, you know, fun banter, they have a big old party to celebrate what he did, and then we kind of get another cold moment uh, between the king and Naira, because she turned things down, he found out, you know, blah, 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 and, uh, Damon's kind of just there, it's like, basically, Damon and the king talking, then, uh, what's her name, uh, Hightower's there, and Renera comes over, she tries to, you know, give a couple daps to, the, uh, to Damon, and then, you know, Coma between her and the king, she goes, she goes sit over and goes do some other shit, and Allison comes over, it's like, hey, Basically, kind of like I'm taking that this thing didn't go well. Long story short, they become friends again for the time being. They're back close. Uh, and then, really, after that point, we get to what is the biggest event uh, of this entire episode and when we'll have the reparations going forward. She goes back, we kind of flash forward to like the night of that day, and basically, she gets a letter from our boy Damon. Uh, who's like waiting out in a robe? Uh, I guess he pretty much tells her like, "Hey, bring us some shit that'll make you look, you know, not a Targaryen." And they go out in hiding to basically the pores, uh, the poor area. Uh, and they go to poor land, and basically it looks a lot like um, pretty much the most not vile, but like the the least kingly part of king's landing that uh exists in uh in this world uh that we've seen to this point in game of thrones and in this universe itself just brothels uh people doing stupid tricks uh, not really stupid some of them cool actually it was a cool shit people just trying to make an honest living you know in a very honest world uh and it's very raw uh great scenery great cinematography uh some great shots a, a very uh, interesting, interested-looking Renera and everything that's happening. I think that was pretty cool to kind of see how Renera isn't, like, just, you know, snooty. Like, she was amused the entire way through, but it wasn't, like, just some snooty, like, ah, oh, look at these fucking monkeys dance. It was, like, really, like, legitimate interest, I felt like. And, uh, you know, she was in the streets and handled her shit pretty well, I thought, all things considered. So, um, we kind of get a little bit more of that. And I forgot what set it off. Uh, there's there's a bad moment where they basically kind of, I think this has happened already in the series, but uh, in season in, in the first series, the, the original, basically reminiscent of the retelling of the story to that point uh, of the Starks getting killed and the the Lannisters coming to power. That whole musical play stuff that the normal people did, the common folk that uh, Arya witnessed. Basically that same shit, but uh, the Targaryens uh, leading to Aegon's birth. Uh, basically from the beginning of the series to Aegon's birth. It's just that shit happened in a play, like a two-minute play. And uh, our queen, our princess, I guess, did not agree with that. She kind of ran off. Uh, got caught by Sir Harwin, uh, one of the knights, who kind of just played it off I guess, once he saw Damon walking around the corner uh, looking for her. So they go do something, and uh, she says she wants freedom. Freedom. So he takes her. I, I don't know if it's because of that, but he takes her to a brothel. And uh, around this time, we also start getting you know a little bit more of uh, what's happening at King's Landing. Uh, we see that the the rot, I believe, is basically the grayscale, if I'm, if I'm guessing correctly. I call it Scarlet Rot because I was like, fuck it, you know. Shut up, Melania. Uh, but the rot, some type of rot, has, has spread uh, in multiple patches around the king's body. And um, we also later see that his two fingers are gone uh, from the rot. They, I guess he couldn't save the fingers. So I think that was a, a talking point um, a few episodes back, was that they'd have to, I guess, amputate the fingers possibly, uh, and maybe try to do whatever they could to save them. But those fingers are gone. And that's why it does like the Michael Jackson gloves all the time type thing. But essentially you know we have this moment where because before this I, I forgot to mention this but basically when they were still in king's landing uh damon and renera had this kind of beautiful moment where they kind of not beautiful but like very impactful moment where they kind of have a discussion 
from both a woman who's very rebellious, really a girl who's very rebellious about the current system, and a guy who's done everything in his power to basically size up the system and get to where he wants to get to. Uh, so these two people that are very malcontent-ish have this discourse about the idea of marriage and relationships. And in that scene, there's some very odd uh, mannerisms that are like larger than uh, just a friendly uh, uncle talking to a friendly niece. So it's a very weird behavior that I peeped on that. I initially saw it, but I didn't think much of it because there's been hints of weird scenery, uh, kind of, you know, weird just vibes that are a little bit, not a friendly and pure between these two and he even like touches her neck like the conversation begins with him like just touching her necklace not saying shit at all uh in response to one of her questions so okay uh so we we see that um hightower is choosing to bathe the king instead of the indentured servants uh the, the fucking poor people that can fucking clean up matted old man <laughs> Because you got to make an honest living. Uh, so she takes like the rag from them and like does it herself. A rag being, a, if you're not from like, I don't know, black or from the south, a rag is like a hand towel. Um, she takes the rag from them and like wipes him down herself, like a, probably a two minute scene. And they kind of like, it concludes with her saying, like, you have a pretty touch, loving touch. That scene to me, my interpretation was just like, they're trying to show this is more than just a political marriage on some level, uh, which does matter in the course of these two people and how you perceive them towards the end of this episode uh at least when things are god damn oh shit uh, when you kind of look at how this plays out basically towards the back of the episode so we go from that to damon taking renera to a brothel which you know i guess freedom so very classic game of thrones as seen kind of like this sweeping as they're walking through the brothel, kind of the sweeping camera view of just how crazy it is, they chose to go without the uh, Targaryen, uh, without the uh, the hiding attire, so they look like actual Targaryens. Because you could spot a Targaryen, or at least a, a uh, what do they call him, a Valyrian, Valyrian individual from pretty fucking uh, far away. And because I guess it'd be in a brothel, like it's like you don't have to hide, you can have your freedom here, you know. Kind of, it's some, there's some dialogue that Damon kind of provides that makes it more apparent why they are not hiding at this point. But essentially, the idea here is that you can see anybody through this brothel. So many people have come through this brothel. Uh, if you flash back to the original series, Robert Baratheon was a commoner in the brat in the um, the brothel that uh, I think the the chief that got killed by Joffrey. Uh, one of Littlefinger's primary brothels. That was one that he frequented pretty often. Uh, so, uh, ideas, you can see anybody in a brothel. It just doesn't matter. You know, pretty much what happens in a brothel stays in a brothel. So, we go from there to uh, basically looking at the brothel to interacting with the brothel because he takes her directly into the middle of it. Uh, we see a guy sucking a guy's dick, uh, people eating ass. Uh, women, orgies, you know, just everything you could think of. I mean, everything you could think of. And essentially, we kind of start, you start laying it on this point. Like, there's some emotion about the transpire here that's more than just a, uh, <laughs> as if you would think that just an uncle took a sister to a brothel for just, an uh, uncle to a niece to a brothel for just no reason at all, just to show her, you know, what that side of the, the world's like. There's some more emotions at play there. So, and it's, it's, it's layered. It's paralleled, uh, coupled with, at the same time that they're at the brothel about to do what you would expect two people to do at a brothel. Um, Allison Hightower gets called in to the uh, the king's bed, and they have sex, and it's very disturbing. Very dis one of the I think coldest and most non emotional. But it's intentionally non emotional scenes, I think, has been, has been depicted in the entirety of this franchise. So, Alison Hightower, we kind of had her own steez earlier when talking to Naira that, you know, this shit sucks. Being in here, you know, I'm not even Alison Hightower anymore. I'm just the queen. Uh, and then Ranera has her little quip about, you know, uh, well, you know, I'd hate to just be somebody that's wed and just only used to fucking produce babies. And then Allison just is despondent at that point in the conversation. 
we see kind of what making of that is. This is almost this almost calls into question the the moment that we saw just a few minutes ago because the king is just like fucking plowing right now right now uh Allison uh Scarlet Rod is back and all just very disgusting An old man a flabby old man fucking a uh what is in this series uh a character that is underage um just a very haunting scene I'd say honestly um and we get to that and she's just mirthless just no emotion at all uh just like waiting for the end i mean if you like watch any movie where like the there's like a, a a prostitute that's like just doing this for money that's almost exactly what happens here at one point he like grabs her hand which i don't i didn't think about it at the time but i he might i don't think he grabbed her hand with the woman without the fingers i don't think so but i have to go back and check I guess I could look at it right now. Let's see. But uh, basically, we get this very emotionless scene, and then we get this emotionally charged scene that parallels it between uh, the uncle of Renera and Renera basically having this very emotional moment, pretty much her first real foray, as we've seen, uh, into any kind of affair with a man. And, you know, basically, it's charged by David. I mean, they have this kind of look. Uh, most of the times, you kind of just get this kind of circling cinematography shot where um you see damon basically you know face to face i mean it's height difference but basically face to face uh draped together with uh our princess and they kiss which was just something i i think anybody would have a brain could see was going to happen pretty quickly in this franchise but you just never wanted to see it and i certainly did not want to see it um so it happens they start kissing and um damon does what he would do with a prostitute and kind of undresses her uh and turns her around as if he's going to try to hit it from the back which pretty much covering her face up uh i guess basically thinking of her as just a nobody or whatever um you know just you can kind of see like where the non-emotional aspects of this come to play, but it's a very charged scene. We kind of see basically, you know, I don't, I forgot how old. I think she's supposed to be fifteen or sixteen. We see a young girl with basically her first foray into any kind of sexual activity, which pretty disgusting in of itself, obviously. Uh, when you see Game of Thrones do these type moments, like some, you know, like Arya Stark, right? Like who's looks like a, a fucking like twelve year old boy for the entirety of the franchise, which. I will say, like, that was partly led by Arya. Arya wanted to have that moment. Like, the actor, the actress, she wanted to have, like, that I'm an adult moment. Like, that empowering, like, I'm not a kid anymore. Uh, I read an article about that, like, like after the series had ended. But, to have to say, like, when they have these moments, it's supposed to be as uncomfortable and jarring as it appears to be. And this was very uncomfortable to obviously see an uncle and a, a niece get it on. But... Especially Damon leads on to where they are kissing and it's, you know, it's just like how you would see any of the, you know, orgies that occur in this brothel occur. Um, and he's really making her like a romantic thing. They're kissing and he starts like kind of taking her stuff off. And, uh, you know, I think she's trying to make it more of like a, an equal partnership here. But he just turns it around. Um, I get the, the nitty gritty, but he like, undresses her basically. And then when she's really trying to get into it, like going to the next step make this an equal thing, you know, um, kiss him from the front, you know, stuff like that, undress him. We're trying to, like, play it up, you know. Uh, he just can't do it. Like, he literally just is un unable to do it, completely bails out on it, uh, does not want to kiss her again. After he look really looks at her, it's like, I can't do it. And essentially, he runs away. Uh, she's emotionally raw, as you would imagine. And a spy... That we come to find as a spy later. I thought it was some. I thought he's gonna try to like, basically rob her some shit. Cause you can see she's a Targaryen, uh, very obviously at this point. I thought little boy's gonna try to rob her some shit. Basically, um, we had this moment where, uh, essentially, she's being spied on, and kind of reminiscent of the former Hand of the King. Well, the original Hand of the King that we see, <laughs> Littlefinger, who. And for all intents and purposes, this guy's supposed to be Littlefinger, like, 
put the, the project in her little finger. And uh, the spies, there's spies there. And um, the spy catches her, goes to report it to whoever. The White Worm, I'm not sure if that's a code name that was used at all in Game of Thrones, but it's the same thing basically between Littlefinger and uh, our boy here, uh, Mr. Otto, Mr. Hightower, Mr. Hightower. Uh, Hightower at this point is actively tracking her movements. I would imagine looking for seats of Discord. Actually, you could probably guess that probably is the case. So she runs back uh, to to the, to the crib. Somehow she by herself without Damon Targaryen uh, makes it as a Targaryen. She looks like a Targaryen. She doesn't have her hiding shit on nothing. No attire, no costume. Just Renera Targaryen somehow makes it back to the fucking castle in one piece without being robbed, killed, whatever. Um, not exactly realistic, probably, but whatever. So she makes it back. And Kristen Cole is still standing there because he watched her go in originally and go to bed, quote unquote. So he's been standing watch and she walks past him, goes inside. Um, he's like, what the hell happened? I should go snitch, basically, and reports to somebody. She's like, no, he opens the door for him, brings him in. They fuck. I don't even get into it, but they, they fuck. Which I think also another element that we probably expect to come happen at some point. They run access. So they do that and they actually go through with it, which... I was looking at like Twitter at that moment, and I thought that he pumped it or something like that. I, he didn't want to do it initially. It seemed like he's very honorable man, uh, very Jon Snow esque, honestly, very honorable guy. But she eventually bases him into it, or I guess goes him into it more than anything, and they go through with it. So from there, we get basically uh, a really I, I don't know how to even have to think about this scene, but we get a moment where we see uh, also we see that Damon is like at a brothel that I guess was owned by his former, well, I guess it's still his current wife, um, but the chick that, the, the bronze B-word, as he put it, I'm not going to call her B-word, I've said a lot of bad words, I'm not going to call her B-word, but the bronze B-word, um, he's apparently just at, he's probably, he shouldn't be hung over, I would guess, but at this moment, he's supposed to be pretty, you know, sobered up, uh, he wakes up and she's kind of like rescued him, quote unquote, um, got him back to a safe bed, and what we get from there is this moment that see, I still can't interpret exactly if it's real guilt or not. But essentially, Otto, sitting there pondering, I guess the best way to present this, thinking, pontificating, uh, pondering, really sitting here thinking about where to go with this. And I guess he decides, let me just tell the king that this happened. So he finds out, uh, or he found out from the spy that this happened. Processed the, the information, brought it back to the king. So he tells the king that basically Damon and uh, old girl had their moment. And of course, in Viserys' way, Viserys is just so much emotion, so much. Uh, the, the problem with Viserys is that Viserys is so astute, but his emotions are so powerful that it just, it's like two equally positive and negative factors. <laughs> oh my god, I'm sorry. Uh, powerful negative factors kind of coalesce. Because he figures out in this, or at least he finally admits to us, the watcher, that he's aware of Otto's uh, designs, as he put it. But at the same time, he's so emotional, emotional about that information coming from Otto that he ignores the validity of that information, the potential validity of that information, and doesn't even think about the possibility that like this was a play by Damon, at least not at that moment. So we go from there, uh, and we see that Allison has been basically uh, watching over this uh, an entire time, you know, this conversation, the spies and all that stuff is occurring, and she confronts Renera about it, to see what Renera is talking about, because she's more interested in Nair's opinion of it than Damon Targaryen's. So she confronts her, asks her about it, and then basically, Renera tells her what is really a half truth, but closer to a truth than a, a you know, a, a falsity. Because we are like really breaking emotion between the two of them, where like they are clearly now at this point like what what occurred is bigger than either of these two. Like they're trying to get basically their angle pushed out of why they're coming to this event, looking at the way they were looking at it. And we had this moment, like, these are not like, two girls anymore that are just like, you know, happy-go-lucky, you know, blah, 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 blah. Two big, mo two 
individuals that realize that there, things are big now. Things are big. There is weight that's larger than even the King's Landing that, that's going on and that could be affected by this event. Essentially, uh, Alice is approaching the like, you know, basically of the King's wife. Uh, and it, like 75% the King's wife, uh, 20% like the, you know, uh, I, actually, I see probably like 55% the King's wife, like 45% uh, Naira's friend. Like, kind of, a eh, little bit more. Like, she mentions explicitly, like, we tried to get you set up with a real partner. Now, because you've been fucked by your uncle. Uh, and she even mentioned that this is a queer custom because one thing we got to keep in mind is that, like, this stuff that they do, like, the incest in this, is, like, looked down upon by, like, pretty much all of uh, Westeros. Almost all of Westeros thinks, like, this is disgusting. And we saw that in the original universe as well. Um, I mean, Sansa Stark mentioned it, like, 55 different times that you can't be fucking, you know, you. Anyway, um, so yeah, we kind of get that pretty often in the original universe, and it comes back to the head here. It's a queer custom. It's very weird. So, basically, she, after the emotions start really pouring out, and we kind of get into more of a I'm your friend, I'm your sister type thing, um, Renera does give some honesty. They do have some drinks. They do go have a good time on Damon's behalf. She kind of blames it on Damon. Quite a bit. She throws him on the rug quite a bit, I would say. Not completely, but quite a bit. And she basically says that they were at the brothel, and they just didn't do anything. Uh, they were there. There might have been some touching, but there was not actual... Well, actually, she, she explicitly says there was not touching. She says that explicitly. I'm thinking that, me personally, I'm thinking that the way... What, what touching meant at that moment was that there was no sense, basically. Because kind of the overtones of the, the half-truth is that, like, they were at the brothel, you know, they might have had too many drinks, but there wasn't actual sex that occurred. That's kind of the tone I get from the conversation. And that's what makes it half-truth is that they did have some kind of, you know, contact that was unseemly, but they didn't have sex. And that's what Renera, that's what allows Renera to confidently, you know, basically lie on her mother's grave um, that they didn't touch. Because theoretically, they didn't. They didn't touch theoretically. Like, I mean, they did more stuff than you... that might be considered touching, but they didn't actually touch. And that personal boundaries, personal opinions on what touching is, you know, yada, 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 this is old middle e middle e medieval English language here. We're kind of basing these half truths on but essentially they did not have sex and that's both the truth and kind of hiding some uh some some things into the shadows but essentially we leave the conversation with allison believing renera and i just thought just a really masterful displays of emotion uh renera wins the episode convincingly i think uh but some of her standout moments are Coupled by other really good performances. I think every moment between her and Allison in this episode is fantastic. Uh, I think the, 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 the Damon dynamic plays out is great. Uh, both in a political theater nature and just seeing these two individuals that clearly had a relationship. That it was not entirely just uncle and niece from the jump. Sometimes it's been more of political enemies. Sometimes it's been more of almost equals. Uh, that are speaking to each other about their own trauma in a certain way. And then we have some very weird emotions that came out in this episode. But they've always had a weird dynamic that was not Uncle Denise, um, for the most part. And we go from there to, you know, Renera kind of feeling, uh, I guess, almost vindicated. That, like, hey, she kind of like, you know, snaps on the wrist. Like, you need to be more of a fucking lady. Uh, almost like a mother. You need to be like more of a lady. She kind of has like a fucking nose flare up and shit. Which, uh... Not Olivia Cook, but uh, Emily Carey. This uh, fucking nose, like she has, like um, kind of like that uh, you know, kind of like the English, like British person nose, like kind of a little pokey or something. You like see her like fucking flare her nose, like you can tell it's like real anger being displayed there. Um, white people have big noses, but British people have big fucking noses, long ass noses. Um, 
So we get to that point and we get to finally, apparently Damon has somehow walked back to the castle from the brothel and he walked to the castle and as soon as he got into the castle, he's been dragged into the, uh, the Iron Throne room and basically gets dropped off there, drunk as hell. Apparently somebody walked from there to here, being drunk as fuck, which, okay. Um, the king comes in. Very, very, very pissed off, as you can imagine. Uh, asked the question. I mean, it's just straight blunt shit. He asked the question, did you have sex with my daughter? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, basically, like, like, yeah, without saying yeah, but, like, basically, like, yeah. Um, and then we kind of had, like, this blunt reality of it that didn't actually happen. Like, it's not actually the reality that occurred, but he basically depicts it as how the king would depict what happened after he heard from the king. Uh, or the, the, uh, the hand of the king. Basically, everything that Viserys thought happened, he confirmed it. He, doesn't, he didn't deny anything that happened. He just said, hey, it happened. She's sullied now. What are to me? I will bring the house back. And at the end, we kind of figure out it's a play that, you know, it's basically ultimately, ultimately been a play to kind of make Renera his, in a sense. And, uh, have access to the throne, I guess, multiple ways, potentially. Really, he doesn't have access to the throne at all, but, you know, I mean, I guess if the king dies, I mean, he'd have a shot just being a Targaryen, but now we have it aware. He wants Rhaenyra, so he can have a guaranteed shot, and basically, the king kind of sees through it a little bit, you know, maybe not all the way. I don't think we see all of the political um, aspects that Damon took in this episode, I don't think it was just as simple as he wanted Renera to marry for you know blah blah blah. Also, there's definitely some emotional aspects because I mean even basically he asked Damon first, and Damon's like, oh yeah, I did, I did, blah blah blah. Asked Renera second, or pretty much hardly talked to Renera about the estate particularly, but talked to her second. So the reality that's been put in his head by Damon is the reality basically. So. Some emotional conflicts there, some emotional warfare. We go from there to uh, Damon, I mean, Damon basically being kicked out, basically. Like, hey, get the fuck out of here, you are out of here. I don't, get the shit out of here now, you fucker. Um, Alicent and Viserys talk again. Yada, yada, uh, Damon's a liar. Renera is truthful. Go ask Renera, please. Talk to Renera, please leave her. Please. Um... Renera gets brought to the king. They have their own discussion. And it's basically like he shows her the blade that has the prophecy, the uh, prince that was promised, a song of ice and fire. Um, it literally is inscripted in the blade itself. And he's like, okay, this, you have so much weight here. You matter so much. And that's why I'm going to marry you to House Valerian. You're going to marry them. You're going to uh, wed our houses. I'm tired of seeing you go around uh, fucking my brother. Um, so, no more of that. And she kind of explains to like, you know, well, I didn't actually do that. You know, you got to trust me. She's like, it doesn't even matter. The, the reality doesn't matter, which at the end of the day doesn't. The thought process is what matters. The imagination, the narrative, that matters more than anything in Game of Thrones. And to this point, it has married more. Uh, I mean, Robert Baratheon, the idea of Robert was bigger than Robert ever was to us. But it's the same thing here. The potential that uh, two Targaryens that relate to the king decided to have relations matter a lot more than if it actually happened or not. So, yeah, truth doesn't matter. You're marrying uh, the other white people or uh, white-haired people. Boom. So he's like, she's like, okay, I'll do it. Fine. Fuck it. But you, motherfucker, that dickhead has been spying for me for apparently months. Months. You got to get him the fuck out of here. That's the only way I'm doing it. You got to get him the hell out of there. You know that he did that shit. Kind of like a, a Tony Soprano. Uh, if you remember the episode where Tony Soprano has a dream uh, about the fish that's talking. Uh, basically, the fish is pussy. Big pussy. Uh, Salvatore, I think. Salvatore, big pussy, clumpy air, Something like that. Um, but big pussy. And he's like, hey, I'm a rat. <laughs> it's just like I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a confidential informant. And like He's like a, literally a dream that's confirming to Tony Soprano that, hey... This dude is a rat. You've been seeing it for months. 
you knew it from the jump. You just been lying to yourself because that's your homeboy. It's almost like verbatim like that. Except they weren't that much of a homeboy at this point, honestly. So he confronts Otto about it. He's like, "Yo, you've been helping out my granddad, my dad, but some real such shit happened where you kind of ascended to the throne and you've been looking out for number one the whole time since then. You gotta go. Sorry." <laughs> it's like literally just like that simple. You gotta go. Um, this grandbaby that is born and has your blood in it, you've been wanting that motherfucker for as long as you could possibly think. And the second my wife died, your daughter comes along. That's kind of suspect, bro. Uh, so it basically, he does the fucking. I saw it. I got this from KGT. But like, he does like the TI in. Um, what's that movie called? Atlanta? I, I forgot the goddamn what the movie's called. The skating movie. I forgot the name of it. But ATL. He, he, he uh, takes. When T.I. takes the fucking necklace and rips off the girl's neck in ATL, uh, it's almost that same shit. He takes the fucking hand, uh, the, the king's hand, um, off his lapel. He's like, grabs that shit. Just keeps moving. That's not actually his lapel. That's his fucking like, shirt pocket. Like, he, just, he rips the shit off of him and keeps it moving. Um, Otto, like, his fucking lips are quivering and shit. Basically, like, we come back to it where, like, Viserys has a keen, astute sense of treachery. But his emotions always are so big. They're big. So his brain has figured out that Otto has been scheming for a minute. I don't know if he even at that moment cares about other potential angles or other potential uh, vultures, so to speak. But he knows at this moment that Otto is the most obvious vulture in his area. And he's like, fuck it. You're done. You're out of there. So that's pretty much the last big moment. Uh, oh, wait. Yeah, we get the fucking... So this this is a hell of a scene. And it's so short, but it's just such a powerful thing. So basically, the... I think they're called the Grand Maesters. The, the, basically, the, the witch doctors that are on the actual court of the king. Uh, he comes through with this, this tea. And basically, you know, without saying it outwardly, because this is, you know, 2 BC or whatever, um, he's like, yeah, this is to kind of uh, alleviate any unwanted consequences of actions. And she gets the implication. Basically, it's Plan BT. He has created Plan BT, which, you know, if stewed the wrong way, he could do this and that, but they got it done quickly enough to where it still has potency. Plan BT. And that's what it ends out on. Her looking at the Plan BT, and that's the end of it. I'm sure I talk about it in the, the preview. I did not watch the preview, but that's the last scene of the episode. I thought this was a tension on episode. I would say episode one to me, if I remember correctly, episode one was, I think, a nine out of ten to me. I think I gave second episode an eight out of ten because it was a little bit more uh, kishy and uh, not kishy per se, but like just uh, flawed, kind of like closer to, I don't know. I just gave it 8 out of 10. Like, I feel like it was a really good episode. I don't want to go to 9 out of 10. If I remember correctly, that's the first one where, at the end of it, Allison is named the, uh, they took to, to, you know, the, the queen to be the king, uh, king's wife. And that was a really touching episode because we kind of get, uh, uh, even closing bond between, closer bond between the two, uh, Allison and Naira. And then it splits apart. I really love the episode. Third one was really cool and really late era Game of Thrones esque, where it was just coincidences, emotional moments that ne don't necessarily have the logic behind them to make them feel early Game of Thrones esque. Like, it's cool, right? He said, fuck it. I'm going to go down before my brother can come. I'm going to end this shit myself. I'm not going to have my brother baby me. This is my big moment. If I fail here, I'm never gonna be that nigga. Like he that he he needed that moment. And it's obviously done a lot for Damon Targaryen, but he needed that moment. It's just the logic of how that battle played out was so coincidental. Or not coincidental, but so lucky. Um lucky, basically. It's just, it was luck. There's a lot of luck going into that battle. And uh unfortunately, it was a great it was cool, it was a very cool looking battle, but it's just like, you, you leave that wondering how the hell did this stupid-ass set of people 
survive for three months, even thrive for three months in this war against these fucking dudes. I think it was three three years or three. I think it was three years or three months. Three years against these dudes, and basically almost be on the, the cusp of winning when they're that fucking stupid. I don't know, but um, that was. I don't, I don't know how to rate that episode because I really liked that episode, but it's just that 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 scene was so fucking dumb. And then we get this one perfect. I, I really just perfect. I, there's no complete. This is outside of outside of her walking back without being fucking mugged. The richest person in that fucking area at that moment. Then I get fucking mugged, uh, held hostage. Any number of things that probably should happen to somebody in a situation never happened. That was a bit embarrassing to me, just logically speaking. But it's a perfect episode. I mean, that's me nitpicking. I mean, so you, got, you got to tell a story, right? So you got to tell a story. And if it's outside the purview of your story, you just don't care to, to say it. Uh, oh, shit. Did, uh, oh, Mike Evans got a fucking touchdown. I might be up. Oh, my God. I'm so close to being up. Oh, my God. Why me? God, why? Please. I just need to be up, dude. I ask you, Lord, please. <laughs> I see what you did for others. I, I need it for me as well. Um, this is so poor. I, I know you shouldn't be doing this in the middle of fucking... I mean, I had such a good rhythm going. I checked my fucking phone. I see the fucking. It, it's seven minutes left. Tampa Bay nineteen, Dallas three. If you can give me like a Brett Maher field goal or a Dalton Schultz touchdown, Schultz touchdown, or just a positive Tony Pollard like fucking run, thirty yard run. I'm not gonna make them money. I feel like anyway. This was per, this was prime Game of Thrones as the pacing was great. Uh, the cinematography was wonderful. We didn't need big old fucking weapons or dragons or really like make this impactful. It could have been a very low budget episode, and it was good. I I think for some reason we've gotten to a point where HBO thinks bigger budget equals better uh, product. Which you look at how much they're trying to do to know the scope of this series. Now that you have a series that has multiple dragons that are alive at any given moment, I don't see you have to have more of a budget, but. This could have been probably the lowest budget of the uh, entire season, and it was the best far uh, best episode so far. You don't need up. You don't need a budget. You just need good storytelling, wonderful storytelling, wonderful dialogue, uh, great progression of the plot, or at least the the, the narrative, uh, the very major narrative that uh, there's vultures around the king, and he's starting to understand that they're present, and. Which, Kind of figuring out everybody else. That's not a vulture plays into that. Alice Nye Tower, uh, Targaryen, Kama Rhaenyra, even Sir Kristen Cole. Uh, Kristen Cole, I think, is probably the X Factor in this episode. Uh, it's always cool to see how honor kind of clashes with duty in this universe because it does often, as we've seen. That's it. I think that's. I think that's a good point. I, ten, 10 out of ten. Uh, I love this episode quite a bit. I uh, hope to do another review in the future. Uh, for the next episode, uh, which I don't know what it's going to be about. I actually, I, I, I actually thoroughly enjoy having that sense of mind. I don't know what the next episode is going to be about. I have no idea. Hope it's good.